with Daenerys Leave Me Alone was one of our first big wins. So it was like, all right, teaching a staff how to grow a record and to get a record to go as far as it did. And then, you know, know in turn to partner with epic and Khaled and then how do you manage that relationship and work through that and then you know as it goes and then we have uh Lakel who Hovain manages you know the first record he ever put out literally song number one that he ever put up anywhere went platinum without radio from a fully independent company with no help from any major or anything I'd be willing to bet you could probably count on one hand other artists that have accomplished that. Jordan, what's happening, man? What's up, Sam? How you doing, man? Uh, we chilling, locked in, uh, figuratively and literally, but we're pushing forward, yep. man. But couldn't be more yep. excited about the guests that we have today. Today we have Hovain Hilton and Chris Hershey, both from Cinematic Music Group. Hovain Hilton is the president of Cinematic Management, and Chris Hershey is the chief marketing officer of Cinematic Music Group. Cinematic Music Group is an incredible record label uh, management hybrid that has worked with a handful of truly amazing and uh, a large roster of amazing artists. I think on the when it comes to kind of independent management companies and record labels, I think these guys are uh, the front of the class. So. Really excited to dive into a lot of the different tactics, both uh, also really excited and enjoyed this format, given that it was, I mean, the president and CMO kind of going back and forth with each other. I think it gave a lot of really valuable perspectives into how they've been able to really grow and scale their their management company and label and service their artists. They have, um, I mean, we, we dive into how... Flip De Niro's Leave Me Alone went double platinum. We talk about the the keys to storytelling and how to truly builds an engaged fan base and audience. Um, what do you think, Jordan? Yeah, man. I think between these two, there's an incredible wealth of knowledge. This is obviously the first time that we've interviewed two people at the same time um, over over Skype, I mean, over over Zoom. Um, and it worked out really well. I thought the chemistry between all of us was really was really positive. Um, I thought the the conversation flowed really naturally. Um, And I think people, and these are, you know, some of my favorite episodes when they do this is just off of the stories of our guests. There'll be a lot of gems. You know what I mean? We we didn't really even necessarily have to ask too many questions on super tactical things because, you know, as soon as you ask what happened with, you know, Flip De Niro's song, Leave Me Alone, they went through the whole thing. And if you were paying attention, there were five of them in there just like that. So, um, you know, it was very easy for, for me as a host, I'm sure for you too, Sam, to, to get value out of them because they're just filled with it. So excited so for everybody to hear it. And one last thing before we dive into the episode, but very, very excited because today, the day this episode was launched, we have officially released the Music Business Podcast Patreon. So Jordan and, I and Noah and our team have come together to put together what we think is just uh, a new way to create even more value for you guys. So there's a couple of different ways in which you guys can become a part of the community. I think the, the one we're most excited about is we're creating a Discord group where we're going to be able to share different trends, have conversations with each other, do some virtual networking. We'll also give you guys access, uh, early access to who we're going to have on the episodes. So that way you guys can submit some questions that you actually want us to ask our guests, as well as uh, AMAs uh, exclusively for members of the Patreon community. So if you haven't already, go to musicbusinesspodcast.com slash community. That's musicbusinesspodcast.com slash community. And we'd love for you guys to become a part of the community there uh, and are so grateful for the community that we have here. Um, but without any further ado, uh, Hovain Hilton and Chris Hershey. Let's do it. Chris and Hove, how are we doing today? Happy quarantine. Good, good. Thanks for having us, man. Yeah, yeah. thanks for having us, guys. Very Thanks excited. for coming out. Before we get started, can you guys just say which one is which so the people who aren't necessarily looking at the video feed will know who's who's talking? I'm Chris Hirsch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I've never been more pretty. <laughs> All right, but for so, real though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Chris Hershey, uh, I'm the CMO of the Cinematic Music Group. I'm Hovain Hilton, president of Cinematic Management. Amazing. Awesome. So before we dive into, I mean, super excited. I think Cinematic has definitely become a, a very unique and very well-established company in the music industry, both on the kind of the label side, the management side. So very excited to kind of 
talk about the development of the business. But before we even get there, like, how did you guys get involved with Cinematic? And even what were you doing prior to getting involved with Cinematic? If you want to start, Chris. Sure. So uh, I met Shapes when I was at a company called Koch Records. Uh, I was working on a rebranding, so I don't know if it exactly was Koch or it might have been Entertainment One Music. Uh, but we were working Ray J, and we did not have a pop radio team. Uh, Shapes at the time had a partnership or a joint venture with Cinematic and Epic and had Sean Kingston and Nipsey Hussle. And Epic did not have a urban radio or digital marketing team. So I was the head of digital at Kachi One at that time. And so I helped work uh, Nipsey Hussle's digital marketing campaign with Shapes and a group of other folks. Uh, and that's where we first met, kind of circled back uh, for or so years ago, uh, around the last Joey Badass project. Um, and he was kind of, we were just kind of just talking shop and we had kept in touch and he was looking for somebody to kind of come over and help him build out the cinematic music group, the label, uh, cause he had been, uh, he'd got, uh, the funding to be able to really, to build it out, to build out a staff. And he just kind of needed some help so he could do what he does best, which is focusing and finding artists and making records. Awesome. Um, I met Shapes in 2009. I had an artist, Rich Hill, who was Tommy Hilfiger's son. He was on the Smokers Club tour. Yeah. So I met him in passing, just like, you know, he put us on a tour. We uh, talked briefly, and that was that. And then later on in life, I went on to manage Troy Ave and started getting a name for myself and earning my bones and stripes in the music business as a manager. And about the end of 2017, beginning of 2018, uh, he reached out to a mutual acquaintance of mine, uh, who I manage now, Smoke Dizza, and that's his long life, his long friend. And he was like, "Hey, um, I just wanted to meet you, like you know, talk and see you know where you're at with things, what's going on with you, and possibly like you know working together." So at first I was like, "Yeah, whatever." Then he hit me again, like, "Oh yeah, he, he wants to meet, like you know, has a spot in Brooklyn, like you know, I know you're in Brooklyn, so you know maybe I could you know, come together and just, just like talk." So I went and met him. We spoke about. Like all his goals for the company, all his goals for management, all his uh, his visions that he has for a management company, and it kind of aligned with what I wanted to do. So we partnered up. That's amazing. That's awesome. Um, so very excited to to dive into the actual growth of the the company and and what you guys are specifically focused on. But before we even do that, I think just to to get the elephant out of the room, the how are you guys, uh, What what's changed as far as what you're focusing on and, and how you're supporting your artists uh, during this pandemic? Uh, Go ahead. I, I was going to say, like, uh, Chris, being the head of the marketing department and, like, the all-around, just, like, the magician that keeps the ship going, he's uh, been really taking the initiative and having our artists, like, you know, do non-traditional things to keep their fans engaged, to keep the streaming numbers up to make sure that they're visible. So like we've been, we've been really just taking it as it comes. So if this works with engaging your fans and then we see a spike in your numbers thereafter, we're like, all right, though, this is what we need to do. We need to just focus more on this. We're releasing content nonstop. Luckily we have artists that like to work and we have situations where they can record at home and keep putting things out and stuff like that. But we want to make sure that we keep the fans engaged keep them on their socials, keep going lives, just, you know, and c- create unique fan engagement. What are some uh, takeaways that you guys have, have uh, discovered so far in the process? I mean, I think that the major takeaway is, or the, I guess not maybe takeaway, but really the, the, the artists that are winning, right? Whether that's, mm-hmm. you know, Tory Lanez, who I think has done an incredible job or a handful of the artists that have participated in the Versus series that they kind of have created or to come about, right? Like, I think that content is king and fan engagement is king, right? Like, that's where the modern music business is. It's like, who can create the most compelling or interesting content? And then how do you engage with your fan base? And there's a lot of different ways to do that. But I think that a lot of the traditional ways, whether it was concerts, for example, and or, you know, like I was listening to your guys last podcast that you had, um, you know, where you were talking about like, uh, artist listening parties and a lot of that stuff or even like radio has changed dramatically. Like mm-hmm. iHeart let off, you know, 50% and so forth. So it's like, you know, Dizza is a great example. You know, he came up with, I'm not sure who came up with, it was somebody on our 
creative team or Hovain or Dizza came up with the idea to do this uh, series called Independent Thinking. So, it, it, you know, going on live, it's it's played out, right? Like, I mean, like everybody's doing it. People are getting tired of watching it. I've even seen the memes joking about it and so forth. So it's like, what's a little bit of a different spin that's more engaging? And so like Dizza created the show where with the team where he's having on, you know, different independent thinkers, right? Similar to what you guys are doing, right? Like you guys are bringing on people from the business to talk about the business and, you know, what have they learned or stories or examples or what can you teach people that might or, or be, are listening? Same thing with Dizza. It's like, you know, what are the independent thinkers doing? And like, you know, how can you guys create like you guys were talking about all the fortune 500 companies in your last podcast and how many people you know out of uh depression and or times that are challenging how many of those companies are created so it's like he's coming up with interesting dialogue and engagement through that and so the first example is where he had little C's on and C's and him were talking about you know it kind of just came about naturally about how Biggie thought Jay-Z was a better rapper. And so like, then we see that and we see this uh, a campaign that's growing. So then our digital team and our creative team grabs that clip. And then we go to his publicist, Rico, who was on this earlier, has been doing the PR for Dizza, as you guys know, outreach to you guys about this podcast that led to this. It's like, take that and seed it everywhere. That's clickbait. But it also, you know, brings back to the series into the show where he's got Guru and he's had, you know, Westside and a bunch of other guys on there, um, you know, creating engaging content. You know? I think this is where we're going to see who's who. People who are creative and think outside the box are going to win because there is no more box. So the people who are forward thinking and progressive, like most of cinematic staff, <laughs> and there are a ton of there are a ton of other labels who are doing it well and other artists, but there is no more box anymore. Mm-hmm. There is no now it now it's no all right, you get an album, all right, we're gonna pitch it to the SPs, you're gonna go around, you're gonna shake some hands, you're gonna go to radio. There's no more of that. So now mm-hmm. the people who are innovative and think on their feet and have a real hold of what their fans want, those are the people and the artists that are gonna win. And that's yeah. what we're seeing. It's interesting because before there was like, like you're saying, there was a choice between if you thought in the box or out of the box, right? <laughs> like, it's, 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 you can't now. It's, it's like you can't think inside the box anymore. Nope. It's like it's, it doesn't even it doesn't even exist. There's no nope. option to think, you know, in the same way that you've been thinking. And you know that, what I mean? it's like a fundamental shift. In the, it's like a fundamental change in reality. You know, it sure is. Who comes like, outside the line is the best, mm-hmm. and who right. really are is because. To, to be honest, if you're just following a mold, it's like you're working on an assembly line. You put this artist in place, do these certain actions, you'll get the certain actions out most of the time. So now when you have to think and uh, really try and think, you get to see who's who. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, for sure. When it comes to, um, when it comes to uh, revenue, obviously, like on the label side, I was speaking with somebody that was working at a major label and they're like, yeah, maybe there's less inflation uh, and like the the artist deals or the record label deals like aren't as inflated as they were, which might be nice. But as as a whole, like record labels are largely still like business as usual. On the management side, where it's more reliant on touring as a revenue stream, that's taken a bigger hit. And I personally work with some artists in the the house DJ electronic worlds that rely solely off touring. Like as a genre, they don't really stream that well, but they do 200 plus shows a year. So when it comes to like on the management side and like generating revenue for the artists, what are some creative models you've seen there that may be thinking outside the box a little bit so that way the the artists aren't starving? Uh, As Hirsch Hirsch already mentioned, Tory Lanez. Tory Lanez took something on a free platform that was engaging to his fans. People Mm -hmm. loved it. They bought into it. And that overall brought his brand up. So his streams went up. Then that opened the opportunity for him to do YouTube. Now he's getting paid to do the same thing with YouTube. Right. So you gotta, you gotta, like you know, it might not be a huge bag attached to something that immediately, but you gotta build it up. And you gotta source it out, and then you you'll be able to get garner revenue from it. People right. in the versus series are seeing like seven hundred percent increase on their streams once they do it. You're not yeah. getting paid to do the verses, but you then you know you'll you'll reap the benefits from. It. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think that there's also you know I mean this this might be gross record business things that I'm going to say coming out of my mouth. So I'm going to preface it with that. I'm aware that it's coming out of my mouth before I'm shunned from the industry. But, you know, if you're a manager right now, it could be an interesting time for you 
that you've been wavering on to do pub deals and get an advance on yeah. a publishing check. Maybe it's now that it's the time to, to consider that, right? Like maybe if like you've been kind of having an artist that heavily relied on touring or getting money from the clubs or a residency or whatever, you know, if you don't have a pub deal, it could be a nice, I know I've talked to a, I'm not going to name names, but I've talked to a few uh, managers who uh, have, really viable uh, artists that we'd all be aware of if I were to, to say, and they just did a pub deal, you know, ironically right before this went down and he's like, well, we're good for a while. Like I was mm-hmm. like, yeah, you canceled the tour. And he's like, we just did a big pub deal, man. Like we're, we're okay. Like, you know, we've got a record out that's doing well and you know, enough content stocked up music video wise that it, not feeling it as much on, on the touring side, but there's tons of things you can do. You can create dope merch. Vinyl was selling like never before. Create dope vinyl. You invite the people in, and you give them, you kind of give them the music for free, and then you sell them the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Merch, merch is a, a 100% surefire way, as you can watch some of the uh, the purest rap has been doing it for a while with vinyl and figurines, and you look at the uh, Griselda guys and what they're able to do with merch, and even Smoke Dizzle is doing very well with merch and vinyl and stuff like that. You find your, you got to, like you got to, like I said, you have to know your fan base, find your niche engage them then sell to them and there's also like ways and like this is might have a negative connotation around it as well it's like kind of like seen as like asking for um you know uh, it's like performance and asking for money but there's things like stage it that allow you yeah. to be able to stream and for people to donate to you right like you know mm-hmm. i mean it kind of be looks like it could be panhandling so you got to kind of be careful on yeah. how you position it and market it but you know there are platforms that you know allow you yeah like, well, like for example here's something the great that we did right like shapes very much uh, believes in giving back and supporting the community. So very early on in this, I feel like before we even really knew what was going on, he did a live stream where he was listening to music. There's so many people out there that like inundate, you know, people that work in the businesses DMs of being like, yo, check out my music, like get it to your A&R team. I'm the next big thing, whatever. Like, right. Like it's like, okay, cool. So he raised money first initially asking people to donate $20 to him to listen to your record. And then we gave away two singles deals from it. And then he did it a third time and increased the dollar amount and raised a lot of money for charity. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are different ways of like doing that. They all, how many artists have labels, right? Whether it's artists like Yo Gotti that have labels, you know, not that he necessarily needs the money by any means, but like he could come up with like submitting to him and he listens to it on a live stream. There's a lot of different ways to kind of skin the cat that, you know, it's really just about making yourself available and engaging with fans. I think I've, I've seen know, a ton of artists it. doing drops for people doing personal messages. It, there, there's, there's a ton of revenue out here. You just have to know who wants it and give it to them, how to package it to them. Right. 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 Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, on the, the donating to fan, the stage of example, I mean, even like, Twitch and YouTube both offer, offer functionality where you can have like subscribers that pay a monthly subscription to for exclusive access. So I think yeah, it's just a, another idea to throw in the bag. Um, when you guys look back on your, your time at Cinematic, I mean, I think what are some of the biggest changes or developments that have been made that have enabled you guys to continue to raise the bar and service more clients at a higher level? I think for me, right, it's been kind of, it's almost was surprising how few people industry or outside of the industry were aware of cinematic, you know, before coming over there three plus years ago. I'm not sure really people, and even still now, I'm not sure that people really fully understand or appreciate some of the things that Shapes has, has done and also the company has done as a whole, right? Like, I mean, I think that a lot of people might be aware of Nipsey, but they might not be aware that he was behind Big Crit or maybe not Sean Kingston or, you know, whatever. But I think that was kind of one of the first big challenges coming down there. Um, when I came down there, there weren't really many people that knew systems. So like step-by-step, step, it was like, I kind of came down and it was trying to, the staff that was there, it was trying to see what they knew, how they did business and try to teach them, you know, the business, frankly, because I've been at record labels my whole life. You know, I've been at RCA Records and then um, Kachi One. And so after we kind of figured that out, then we started to have some wins. I mean, Flip the Nero's Leave Me Alone was one of our first big wins. So it was like, all right, teaching a staff how to grow a record and to get a record to go as far as it did. And then, you 
you know, in turn to partner with Epic and Khaled? And then how do you manage that relationship and work through that? And then, you know, as it goes, and then we have uh, Lakel, who Hovain manages, you know, the first record he ever put out, literally song number one that he ever put up anywhere went platinum without radio from a fully independent company with no help from any major or anything. I'd be willing to bet you could probably count on one hand other artists that have accomplished that. Maybe two. Maybe. And, and like nobody knows about that. And so it's like, it was like going through the whole process of like really literally growing a company and a company that has a management uh, arm, a record label, a clothing company, a touring business, a brand, I mean, all of these things. It's like literally, uh, growing that process together and a lot of times making a lot of mistakes, doing things wrong, being like, Oh, that we spent too much on that record. You know, we should have done this, you know, we should cut back here. We need this person. We need somebody to be able to hire and focus in on these things. You know, Mm -hmm. we, we didn't have a creative department when we first started there. I really just had a product management department and A&R department, um, and marketing, you know, we Mm -hmm. built a video team, we built a creative team, you know, and figure out better ways to work with the management company and, and, kind of figure it out as we go to be truthful yeah yeah for sure it's a fun journey right right uh, how from your perspective what are some of the, the changes and developments that have been made uh through your or like during the time you've been involved that have kind of laid the foundation to operate at the level you guys are operating i think i'm going to echo the kind of the same things chris chris is it's kind of been like trial and error but then hiring the right people and getting the right mix of people who know their roles and know what needs to be done that was just like so key and now with the uh, handful of wins that we have accomplished, we want to just make sure that it gets viewed a certain way. So having PR and having like, you know, just little steps that all the majors have, we had to make sure we checked all those boxes. And now right. that the boxes are checked, we're kind of like operating at, it's like Voltron, like everything's connected now. Like there's, yeah. there's no big faux pas. There's no miscommunications. Everybody's kind of aware of everyone's role and what needs to be done. Right. We're, now we're dialed in. What do, what do you think right. are some of the, I mean, you mentioned some of the majors uh, and what do you think are some of the pros and cons of working with a independent record label uh, versus a major label? I think, um, I mean, yeah. With, it, with an independent, like, you know, it's like a speed boat versus a yacht. When mm-hmm. we see it, we're ready to turn. Oh, this record's not reacting, right? We could get the building shifted and go with another record quickly. Mm-hmm. With a major, it's a little slower, a longer process to get certain things approved, to get a record out like you know we're quicker mm-hmm. we we can jet in and out in and out of the pockets of course a bigger company is more promotion it's endless millions and millions and millions of dollars they can spend on pr and whatever once once it gets going but i think the ability for us to not match the spends but we can spend a little bit on par but we're still operate like an indie we can right. call a conference call get everybody on the call hey we're going to change the scrap it that's scrapped. We're doing it. You're doing something different tomorrow, and it's done. You right. can't. You, you're not making that happen on a major label. Yeah, I pick a single, and it's it's, it's the wrong single. You're locked in. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think that 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 that's incredibly important. And I think the other thing is, and ultimately, like. I grew up in a major, like I, when I first got hired out of college, my first job was at RCA records. I worked directly for Clive Davis. Like I spent six years of my career, my first six years of my career there. And I learned a lot. I had, I met my wife there. That was some of my best friends and some of the best memories I've had in New York city there. But like, ultimately I left because of the bureaucracy. It's mm-hmm. just like, you have to stay in your lane in the major and I think that affects the artist in a lot of ways because like, yes, they've got a bigger machine in some facets and bigger budgets that might be able to help you at radio or even some of the streaming platforms and so forth. But, you know, ultimately, you know, I feel like that they, they have the reins a little bit more that, and that affects like not only the way that business is done, but also sometimes like the creativity, like, mm-hmm. you know, like, but, but, but truthfully, like that's, for some artists, I feel like that there's some artists that that works really well for. And then I feel like that other artists that that doesn't work as well for, right? Because like some artists, you know, need can be told what to do. And like, and like they have like a, a loose vision and they can kind of plug into the big machine and it works incredibly well, you know. And then there's others that really want to be involved more creatively and have such a vision that they're trying to execute with their team. That's That sometimes can be hard to do unless you are the biggest 
artist in the building and like mm-hmm. the team and, and like you know, like Kanye can walk in anywhere and do whatever he wants and everybody's just going to be like yep cool we're in you know <laughs> where it's a but like, until you get to that echelon from kind of like what would be a priority to us is going to be something that is going to be very low priority on a major right like you know an artist that does a couple million streams a week uh on the uh, on demand domestically is is going to be a priority to us all artists mm-hmm. are a priority, but like that's going to be a pretty big artist for us. And you know, that might not be for a major. And so it, it can, can kind of get lost too, right? Like if you're not a big enough priority within a building, you might have a hard time getting to the team that you need to help push your record forward where mm-hmm. that's a little bit easier on an independent level. The other side of that, if you're the big dog in the big building, to, you know, that you, you need that machine. Yeah, I, left, right. I left a little bit off too. The politics, the politics that comes along with working in a big label. Like you might not get the push because of the A and R that assigned you. He mm-hmm. might not be the favorite, or like there's it, a lot of politics that goes with working in a major label. Right. Yeah, for sure. I can't say it's, so, it's, it's such a necessary evil sometimes to have to yeah. deal with that stuff effectively. I mean, we we spoke That's with a right. very uh, really interesting interview with um, Harrison Rembler from Visionary Music Group, um, and he just Logic. spoke. Yeah. Uh, yeah yeah, and he spoke about the the notion of like, um, and, and as I'm sure you guys are well aware, is just like managing that that dynamic, that relationship with yeah. those people, and, and whining and dining them, even if they're even the, yeah. So I think it's a right. It's all, it's like everybody's getting a Christmas politics. present. It's, I'm flying out. I'm it's seeing politics. You. you leave somebody off an of email by accident. You uh, don't yeah. <laughs> invite somebody out there for drinks. Yeah. So it's it, it's it, it, managing. Like you know, I learned how to manage personalities. But like in a major label, you really, 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 really have to know the managing personalities game because one mistake will throw you your whole shift out the building, and that affects your artists. Yeah. So now the artists behind the eight ball, they didn't even do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. handling them. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of politics. Like I guess with everything, I guess for sure. Speaking of um, management. Um, it seems like over the past decade or so, the role of management has changed a lot. You know, obviously we're seeing a lot of companies um, like Cinematic kind of have a, a management sector and also a, a label sector. Um, so what do you think in your time as a manager have been the the huge shifts that have allowed and um, promoted that shift to happen? Um, and how do you think your role as a manager has shifted uh, with that? I think my role as a manager has become all encompassing. So now mm-hmm. it's like, you're 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 the manager, but you're also more so like the parent almost. Like you have to do a lot. Like you're you're doing a lot, a lot, a lot. And labels, not cinematic. I'm saying specifically, but labels look to the manager almost as if it's a separate, like it's a company. Like mm-hmm. you, with your staff, what can I do? This is a management responsibility. Like a lot of things. Sometimes labels will tell me, and they be like, "Oh yeah, we think this is a management function." Like, no, this is your artist that just, <laughs> that, he, he, he's your property. Like, you know, I think that line has got thinner and thinner to where what's a management's responsibility and what's a label responsibility. Because most labels are looking to do the least work as possible, if we're all being frank here. So they sometimes pass that on to a manager, like, oh, you're responsible for this and this, that, and the third. But um, it's not really supposed to be like that. Mm-hmm. The manager and the artist work in conjunction as a team. Then that manager is a representation of that artist to talk to the label to get what they need from them. Mm-hmm. If that makes yeah. sense. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I used to work at a a label management hybrid called EQT. And we kind of felt like that was sort of similar, sort of happening at a, at the same time as well. It's like we were also investing like money in these artists, but they, you know, there wasn't a, a label deal behind it. It was just kind of, it was just kind of like, you know, <laughs> wait, to help you, but you know, it's, it's sort of like the, the worst version of a loan system, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of labels, a lot of labels, they also are like, man, what could, where could we get the most out of this artist from? All right. We got him in a 360. Maybe we'll get them in some uh, some management points too. Like you know, I'll come on on this end and this end. Mm-hmm. Right. How how do you think the dynamic between you and your clients as a as a as a manager client relationship has changed because of that? And how do you think, um, in order to succeed, you know, that being that close to the artist, how do you think that relationship has to exist? Um. Every 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 management client I look at differently. Like is Alan. Mm-hmm. 
it's not one size fits all. So the needs for Styles P is not the same needs for Lil Kel. Right. You know so having a clear understanding on what their needs are, and how to keep that separate from any label needs. You know what I'm saying? And my right. my, my my biggest thing is to be like super honest with my clients. Yo, look, this is this and this is that. I can't do this. The label should be doing this. It's like you have to be really honest because it can get murky and you can get a confusion like, oh, nobody understands the roles of what's supposed to be happening. So if you deal with people in straight, like brutal honesty and like don't leave any gray areas, I find that to work best. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Makes all sense. Um, awesome. Awesome. So uh would love to dive in. I mean, I think uh Flip De Niro, Leave Me Alone, and even the story you mentioned with Luke, how, uh, how can you just talk through the life cycle? I mean, both of those are breakouts in their own right. So would love to kind of just hear the anatomy of a of a hit from your guys' perspective and, and kind of what were the big stepping stones or turning points uh, along that trajectory. Sure. Um, we'll do, I can do walk through, leave me alone. And then Hovain, we can maybe kind of bounce back and forth or you can start on, on Kel. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Flip had been signed for about a year, year and a half, uh, give or take, um, kind of before that. So we had put out his first EP and I really believed in a model, which I don't want to share the numbers exactly, but I had kind of from working for Clive and also E1 had come up with a model that our whole team agreed upon about spending X number of dollars uh, over basically a year and a half uh, to put out two projects to allow an opportunity for an artist to over a long enough over a year and a half time period to have sustained growth over that time so that hopefully then you like have enough of content out that you're stretching out your opportunity over a year and a half for something to catch hopefully like leave me alone does a lot of times Mm -hmm. it doesn't and much lesser success stories on on a particular single can kind of give you enough to keep going through the album life cycle and didn't do a third record or fourth record or Mm mixtapes or eps or whatever you want to call them right Mm -hmm. so we put out one ep from flip uh, he had recorded the second EP. Most of the records on the second EP, we didn't get cleared except for Leave Me Alone. So they only went up onto the free platforms. And it was right before South by Southwest. Uh, so we put the EP out right before South by Southwest. He went down to South by Southwest. And it really wasn't until mid-April that the song started to kind of catch. And basically what had happened is... Um, Someone on our team was close with somebody on Odo Beckham Jr.'s team. And he, so he, we'd been sending them music and so forth, New York guy, whatever, on the Giants at that time. Um, and he, it was when his trade negotiations were going on, right? And so he danced to it on another, I think, a Jacksonville Jaguars, like, yeah, like, well, like not a not a well known name on a team. Like, he just caught it on Instagram. So we heard about it. We ripped it, and then we had this clip of Odell Beckham Jr. dancing to "Leave Me Alone." And so <laughs> I'm sitting there, and I'm like, hit up Hovain and our team, and I'm like, we have to see this, and we should just tell everybody that this is Odell Jr.'s response to the trade talks. Leave me alone, and like, <laughs> that's amazing. Kinda, Got lucky, to be honest, and like Hovain used his relationships, uh, the team used theirs, got it on TMZ Sports, Yahoo Sports, Bleacher Report, and a few others, and then it just kind of like spread like wildfire, to be honest. We saw a really nice bump in streams that next day, so I came into the office the next day and literally went to the DSPs (laughs) and was like... New, well, but new, I mean, that's just like literally just this, you could get these parts all the time. You got to kind of convert it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and so hit the DSPs up and um, we're like, really like, listen, look at the, like, look at Odell's dancing. Look at all this coverage. We saw this bump, put it into a playlist. They put it into some playlists and then it just all started to kind of literally like grow. And then we were like, you know, let's go to radio and then started to kind of layer on top of it, doing a lot of advertising campaigns digitally to support it. Uh, and then kind of keep building it, started to work at radio. Uh, then we got an opportunity for him to go out on the Tory Lanes tour for like a month and a half. Um, did that while we're working at it radio and then just kind of kept getting lucky to be truthful. Like, you know, uh, 
uh, fill in the blank big sports profile would post it on their Instagram. Then we'd take that and do the same thing that we did with the Odell Beckham Jr. and seed it around and just keep kind of fueling the flames. And then, uh, you know, got all the way to the point of where the Kardashian were dancing to it in a club on socials and by that point in time he was doing well enough at radio uh out opening up for tory lanes every night tory kind of about halfway through the tour started to realize it was a hit and started to come out during flip set and then started to bring him out during flip set or uh him flip yeah, out on his set right yeah and then so like it just kind of kept building and building and building and by the end of the tory lanes tour he sad was managing him is managing him still, you know, was close with, uh, Khaled and Epic and everybody was caught. I mean, like literally everybody was calling us and trying to like get the, get the record. And so we felt that Khaled and Epic were very good partners with us, um, for flip and, and that record and uh, went from there. That's beautiful. Hi. If it could all be so simple, it'd be a wonderful, fun business. (laughs) Triple platinum later, he left that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's sick. That's amazing. I I really love too just the uh, the how quick you moved with the Odell video. Not to just let that be a flash in the pan, but to really capitalize on that by seeding it to the right pages, not only sending it out to the different sports pages, but then using that in order to contextualize uh, outreach to different DSPs to get it pitched for playlists. I think a lot of uh, like those, I mean, if you were to extract those as themes, those are really important things for artists to focus on way too often. It's like people are just hitting up playlists and press with, without context. And I think you, you yeah. hit up the sports uh, media with, with context and then use that to create context to reach out to the playlists, which I think is incredibly yeah. valuable. Yeah, that's right. I think that what the business, there's so many of these hacks going on, right? The Spotify third party, like user generated playlisting campaigns, you know, like the seeding Instagram campaigns, like so much of it. And then you talk to people and it's just like, they expect that to be the end all be all. And it's like, no, that's very supplementary. Like that's a thin layer. You've got to kind of build in to these moments and then build out of them and use the narrative to your, to your point, Sam is like really where you kind of are going to, going to win on all of this right like it's just like we've been talking about the narrative like Hovain tapped on it earlier and you know you've got to kind of create like what is the artist about why is it engaging like Mm -hmm. you know like the quarantine radio felt you know moment like monumental for Tori because it was like he was celebrating getting out of a deal like whether that's something to celebrate or not like you knew that that's why he was doing it and then he parlayed it and parlayed it and parlayed it right like and so I think that that's you know you got to catch a little something and then build on top of it and keep layering. What did um what did that what did the this version of that campaign kind of look like when you were first getting into the industry? What did the for, well so like, I mean so like you know I'm just trying to kind of get get the skeleton of of you know the marketing that yeah. kind of that you just explained when I first got into the business, so we're going to date myself. So I'm 41. <laughs> so I graduated college in 2001, right? Like my junior year of college was like the Napster right. streaming thing. So like, I, as I like to relate to it, I showed up in the business. Like uh, if you like show up at the wedding and like every, everybody's leaving and there's a bunch of like, you know, a little bit left in the cup and like a half shot here and like a quarter drink there. And like the fireworks are over. Like that's where I showed up to the music business. Right. (laughs) So, um, it was, it was similar and different, right. You know, digital was not what it was, right. It was like really about three or four platforms. My space, you know, really wasn't quite a thing yet. Right. Like, you know, so it was like AOL sessions and like Yahoo front page and like things of kind of, of, of that nature. So, the equivalent of it at that time, I think a good example was um, Steve Robowski was a great a r He signed, you know, the Strokes. He was the principal in the Def Jam deal, the original Def Jam deal, um, Soundgarden, all of these great bands. So the Strokes had just put out their debut album um, in 2001, and they were the biggest band on the planet. And so we had he had signed this other band called the kings of leon which at the time was called the brothers follow will which is just the three brothers and their cousin even hadn't joined the band yet so the equivalent of it at the time was we kind of every step along the way we were trying to show them what 
the success look like? So we put him out on tour with The Strokes. We put him out on tour with Pearl Jam, you know, and then we're kind of drafting off of those opportunities, a la similar to what started to happen in the digital age of like, remember when um, Benji and Rostrum blew up Wiz and then they kind of used all of those opportunities to break Mac or to Mm. introduce Mac? Mm -hmm. It was the same thing that we did then, except it was a little bit more analog. So we were using our bands that we were having success with, like the Strokes, is really like the way to be able to get those opportunities for and break the Kings of Leon. So it was kind of a similar, that kind of helps bridge the gap. Cross-pollination. Yeah, it's a hard comparison because there wasn't, it wasn't the same. Are you able to cross-pollinate a lot with the artists on your roster? Yeah, we do it a lot, I think. Well, they definitely yeah. did it with Odell Beckham. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of Southern rappers and who have similar fan bases, right? We, we manage um, JD Youngin, we have Young and Ace, we also have La Soldier, um, all who have similar fan bases. They're all different and unique, but I feel like that if you're a fan of one, you're going to be a fan of others. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we've got, you know, like, playlists that we've created and curated on their platforms and you know we've even debuted songs or videos on other youtube channels or soundclouds and different things and really Mm -hmm. being able to use their audiences to kind of help each other so that we can kind of you know they do songs together which is like shipes you know masterpiece and and it it, it works out well i mean but it's got to be organic and real you can't force stuff i feel like the thing i've learned about this business more so than anything fans smell a fake you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. if you're not genuine and it's you don't believe in the things that your your music and the visuals and the even the lifestyle and all of that stuff people might be into it for a second but then they're like wait no that's not real that doesn't feel real that's not genuine so i feel like that it's got to be honest and it's got to work and so i think we know really well to do that versus forcing it right because there's some things we could try to force like and sometimes it works and sometimes it, it doesn't because we have like, you know, Kel and Ace went out on tour together and opened up for Polo G. Um, that's a little bit of a stretch, but it worked. It worked. But mm-hmm. we know to not take it that extra step and to really force something and to force Kel in front of those fan bases, you know? Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, it seems like, and obviously um, this is a big thing in, in all of music, which is just storytelling and emphasizing a story. But now with the artists being so accessible to their fans, obviously through social media, marketing, uh, digital marketing, that sort of thing, the story is kind of like more prevalent now than ever. So I kind of have a question for both of you is kind of twofold. The first is how relevant is the story today as an a and um, or as somebody looking for new music uh, for for the artists that you find? And, and what characteristics of a of a good story do you think help make the artist easier to market or easier to manage or it doesn't have to be like they were raised in the streets but you know you just you just say one just now you know they're one of them is one is they're genuine and they're real and that comes through through their music so what are some other things that you think are prevalent to a good story um and a a good project to be a part of i think honestly i think it's anything shrouded in honesty has a, a, a amazing ability to grow into whatever. But really what I look for, I look for something that's layered because there's going to be an artist, okay, artist X, Y, you make good music, you have a song, cool. Now look at Wiz Khalifa, there's layers. Uh, tattoos, okay, people who love tattoos are into you. Uh, the Chucks, oh man, I love Chucks. Weed, oh, that's another layer. Amber Rose, oh, that's another layer. There's different layers things to peel back to you besides you know you, you know what i'm saying right like, right uh, and you know personally for for me right like i mean I, we leave a lot of the a and r at least i could say i leave a lot of the a and r from the label to stripes right like i mean yeah. i leave mm-hmm. it to like that's why i came over it's just like i feel like i'm really good on the marketing and the digital side and running a team and i he's one of the best people anywhere near our age and finding records i mean nipsey i mean the Joey, like so many greats, crit, like all of these things he's found, right? Like, and so I, I kind of leave the NR up to him, but like artists that I really love, I like artists that are polarizing. I like Kanye's a perfect example, right? You can't bring up Kanye and be indifferent. 
people either love him or they hate him. And yeah. like, I feel like the, those are the artists that are the ones that are the easiest to, to market, right? That Because it's like, it's got to be honest and real, but also there's got to be kind of some, some, some bite to it and kind of um, evoke some sort of a, a reaction. Yeah. yeah. Like if you talk about an artist and somebody's just kind of sitting there and they're just like, eh, eh, yeah. eh. like it's, it's very, it's very hard to build around that. Cause you're like, you know, love it or hate it, at least that becomes a point that you can kind of lean into and be like, all right, cool. Well, at least they're, it's evoking something. That's true. You want the fans to feel something because to get the people to care. You can have the most perfect campaign, the greatest rollout, the DSP supported it, but if nobody cares, it doesn't matter. You have to get the fans to engage and care. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we, I normally ask these um, at the end, but the conversation is going so well, I don't want to like miss it. So um, I guess for, for, for both of you, what do you think makes a good manager? What separates good managers from great ones? And what do you think makes a good marketing campaign versus a great market campaign? Um, a great manager is someone who doesn't limit their self to one task. I don't wait till something needs to be done to do it. Go out and do it. You uh, keep pushing and keep pressing. Uh, you you question convention. There's no rules. This is the music business. Mm-hmm. People do things this way because that's the tradition of how you do it. That doesn't mean you can't buck the system and ask, hey, why are we doing it this way? There's no rules. It's just tradition. So somebody who's forward thinking, progressive, someone who's honest, um, someone who makes sure you have to make sure your interest aligns with your artist as well. Because your artist might have an idea of who he is and what he is, and you might have an idea of what he is and who he is. If those two things don't coincide, you're going to usually bump heads or you're going to usually end up not working together for very long. Mm-hmm. I can have a plan, a rollout, a whole thing that's connected. And if deep down that's not who you are, the artist won't be happy. And then he's going to get to a certain level of success and say, I don't want to be this. This is who right. you want me to be. You know. So those are all the things that I think make a great manager and also another thing that makes a great manager is someone who doesn't do anything for money. If I don't like your music and I don't uh, appreciate your art, I'm not going to manage you. I know a lot of managers who are with the artist and it's a money grab. It's not because they are a fan of their artistry and that's tough. I can't do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Sorry. Good time. I was going to say for me, for on the management side, right? Like my, my favorite things about a manager are like proactive managers who are organized, which is definitely not something to be taken lightly. I feel like a lot of people in this business are not. So like you have an, or, an organized manager who's being proactive and that like listens because none of us are, I mean, it's a gray area, the whole business. Yeah. <laughs> I never know if I'm right, wrong, somewhere in between, usually one or the other or you know, who knows, right? Like, and so if you can at least talk things out and like, be like, I think this is why I think we should do it this way and have an artist or a manager be like, okay, cool. I hear you, but this is why I think we should do it this way. And then be able to discuss it out. Those are my favorite managers because like, it's always difficult when you have a manager that's like, no, it's this way (laughs) because my artist and I say so in tough shit. And you're like, (laughs) Well, Sorry, Chris. Yeah, my, no bad. my bad. My bad. But like, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, no. That, but I'm just saying, like, you know, it's just like it's hard. But I think that that, and then that kind of answered you to touch on your your other question, Jordan. You know, I think that what makes a great marketing campaign is I like to just see something that's it's creative. I think that really the ones that are able to in these days to be able to. Um, amplify the the music and the artist i think are the the the, the short right there's a lot of different ways that can that can happen but i feel like the the best marketing campaigns when they kind of hit all of the touch points as far as in like they have something incredible you know if things are normal that you can do outside or during these times something that's unique that maybe something hasn't done before or a something that works really well like you know that what this is doing with independent thinking is not new, but I think the way that he's doing it is genuine on brand for him and amplifies his brand and his music. Right. right. So I feel like that the best marketing campaigns kind of amplify the the product and the artist. It's, right. it's the follow up with what Hurst said. I agree hundred percent. And I love cohesiveness. I love when the ro- rollout, I, I compare a roll artist rollout 
to a presidential campaign. You know the slogan, you know the look, kind of the colors, what they stand for. You know, that's the cohesiveness of a good rollout. It's, it's When you know it, when you see it, certain rollouts, you'd be like, wow, this was done amazing. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. yeah. As a consumer, I think um, just in terms of a good marketing campaign, it feels like I'm almost like drinking a glass of water. And then as soon as I'm thirsty for a little bit more, there's something else mm. that kind of quenches my thirst. And then I go in for another glass go for another glass you know what i mean um that's that's it's, it's kind of you know abstract but when i feel like i've been you know fulfilled as a fan it's like oh man okay i'm interested in this oh well now they put out a video now i see what they're you know the video for, for the for the campaign will look like mm-hmm. um you know i'm you know it'd be cool if they put out a song like this or if i saw a feature that they were that they were you know doing because it'd be interesting to see how they interact with other musicians and then they put out a feature it's almost like they're reading the consumer's mind almost at the same time you know um and and leading them honestly it's like it's kind of like they know their fans like those are the best artists that they know their brand so well they know what's going to work with their fan base and how to to reach them so i I agree with you a whole percent it's awesome right right uh would love to circle back on just the subject of strong rollouts the the locale uh story and how that went from the first song he released to going platinum uh, Lokel was super big on Instagram. He had a, a very super big following. The kids loved him. So he would go on and, like, you know, sing little videos in his living room and kids are reposted and you even see them going to TikTok and doing things like that. So with him never releasing anything before, we were like, wow, like, you know, is there a way for us to harness that? So mm-hmm. he previewed the song. I'm not sure how long ago he previewed the song. Maybe it was two, three months before prior, Chris? Yeah, he'd been teasing it for, I think, a few months um, before we even put the song out, yeah. Yeah, so he teased the song, and it was just like, it would react really, 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 really strongly. So I was like, wow, (laughs) these kids are really, they're really (laughs) engaged for a song that's not even out. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they they maybe had 30 seconds of it, if that much. Mm -hmm. So what? Once we released the rec- once we released the record, uh, we ran some campaigns with TikTok as well as influencers, and the numbers are just shot up. And then Chris and his marketing team, once they get their hand on something that's reacting and Shazam and shit like that, is a home run. Yeah, nine point nine percent of the time. I'll hit your Venmo later, Jose, and I'll hit your Venmo later. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that 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 was a large part of it, right? Like, I mean, he had built it people had been engaging with it and truthfully i feel like it slipped through the cracks and this is where i feel like that the major record label system is is faltering right now right like i like i'm not taking shots at anybody right like i think i've Mm -hmm. got plenty of friends that work at majors and indies and everything in between but like majors have taken such a feel out of it right like steve Robalski, to go back to the kings of leon reference he they were terrible when they first when it was the three brothers they were awful awful and like they became selling out madison square garden and the cover of like rolling stone right like he saw something special there you know hovain um his a and r abby kel's a and r abby and shapes saw something special within lakel and signed him off of that but like he had a shit ton of videos on tiktok a ton of them but they weren't married together because the song wasn't out and so there was no metadata tying all that stuff together mm-hmm. to hit all the triggering systems that the majors are looking at right the majors are looking at the tiktok charts and you know like increase on on-demand streams and all of these things but if you don't have a song out there's no way to tie all of that together and so you don't know and so that's where it really kind of is is goes back to kind of the difference between majors and indies on some levels is that i feel like that one of the things we're doing started it and it cinematic i had more followers i don't have a lot of followers uh, than clip the narrow did you know like Lakel didn't have a song out and yeah. we did a deal with him right like that's just like unprecedented and these are we all sports like, guys we're all, we all sports guys right so you yeah. know how baseball with analytics how they kind of like take the manager's role out of it and they go by in this situation you need to bunt right that's kind of like what a major label is now you look at these mm-hmm. numbers these numbers doing this we offer you this it's all analytics it's metrics we do this you have to consult with people. You have to feel it. Like if if Chris is not really into something, no matter how it's performing, you're not going to work it the way. If I'm really not into this artist, I'm not going to really work it and put it there forth. You have to 
You can't take the human element and have A and R's marketers and managers and CEOs away from it and just go by numbers. You're not mm-hmm. going to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not going right. to work. So a human touch and a human know how will always lead you right. You are also sure. in that situation. It's like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? Like the A and R's the CEOs, they're the ones that kind of help put the numbers where they were in the first place. So, so then after that, it's like, okay, well, how much are you going to look at the numbers? Because that was based off of the decisions that so we were made by the artists and their team in the first place. You yeah. know what I mean? So it, it, it gets a little, little weird. I know everybody wants to win. It's a business at the end of the day. So going by these numbers and this metric is, it suggests what you should do and how you should, but it, the feeling of it, it's still music. The feeling you have, for it and knowing and looking at little Kel when he walks in a room and realizing he's a star you can't that that can't be done by metrics or computer mm-hmm. realizing someone's a star and the look you know mm-hmm. for right sure. right um hope when it comes to like team and company culture and structure obviously i think you guys both kind of run and manage your own teams i think what how have you been intentional around creating a culture of performance and, and excellence obviously it's it's not just you i mean it's it's a small army so it, like it's a, it's a team of people and i'm i'm not the biggest super vocal person i'm more of like a lead by example type of person mm-hmm. and i like to coach people up and be positive and positive reinforcements but like you know um i think my name already is kind of in a space tribute like cinematic management wins to me so they're like oh hovain is killing it so I tell them, I'd be like, yo, look, you want them to say Hovain and is killing it, right? Mm-hmm. Y'all want to be the and, so do your thing. Mm-hmm. Like, I yeah, yeah. come with me. I don't want to call nobody to get you in a party. I want you to be able to get into this party on your own. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so I'll, I'll you can come with me. I'll invite you out and introduce you to everyone. But, you know, here, sink or swim. I'm kind yeah. of like a, mm-hmm. a, a throw you in the water type of guy. Yeah, All yeah, right, yeah. go ahead. Think, you know? Mm-hmm. Because you can't, you can't really coddle somebody. You can you can coach somebody up to a certain point, but they have to perform. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I think the best way to, for people to perform is to see you to perform. Mm-hmm. Scotty Pippen was great, but watching Mike be great in dedication to excellence is like, oh shit, he's still here shooting. I'm a shoot too. <laughs> right, okay? for sure. Well, can you talk about some of the? Uh, and obviously, don't need like names, uh, but some of the the harder moments too, because I think what you're alluding to is it's like these. Uh, the moments where people are, are truly going to unlock the, the biggest growth are often when either presented with like really big challenges or even coming out of a major fuck up. Can the you talk biggest, through, Yeah. The, the biggest success always comes from discomfort and how you lean into it. You have to lean into discomfort and into the unknown and the failure. Like, you know, you have to like walk through that. That's, that's how you get through things. That's how you become who you are. Mm-hmm. You're never going to, it's, it's easy to, to be good when everything is good, you know, like now in these times, we're seeing people perform well in a discomfort time. It's a messed up situation. People are dying, streams are down. People that's going to succeed are the people who are th- thinking, forward thinking, and work well under pressure. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah, I was just about to say, it kind of all ties back to the conversation we were having before about. Um, not living in the box and thinking outside of the box. Yeah, there's no, there's no more box. So it's like you know, in in a time now where uh, music and entertainment are all some people have. Like if you can capture the moment and if you can perform really well now and shit, I think people will remember that. Like, oh mm, man, right. yeah, I remember this song. This is the song that was out when, whatever. Or this is the, you know, this is the video that made me feel great when I was, when I was down or a little stressed. Yeah. 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 That's funny. I was just, um, I've been listening to a lot of pop smoke during the quarantine, just like by happenstance. Um, and I was telling a friend the other day, like, damn, not every time I listen to pop smoke, I'm going to think about the quarantine. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I want to tie two things in my head, but that, that also opens up an opportunity, you know, yeah. to be like, you know, oh, these are the things that we do now will be, History. you know, my pop smoke. Yeah. But yeah, exactly. The things that stick in our minds, um, through and through. So, That's why you can never really fully judge music because people be like, oh, this song is better than this song. People remember how music make them feel, what they were going through. Yo, I love this song. I kissed my first girl to the song. You can't gauge that versus somebody else who just heard it driving. Like, you know, this song means more to you. You 
you know, you know what I'm saying? Isn't that why we do what we do, right? Like, I'm exactly. like, for me, like that's like the most beautiful thing about music that you touched on, Jordan. It's just like I can go and listen to music from certain times in my life, and it takes me right back there. 13, 16, 25, first moving to New York City, whatever it is. Like there's just there was music that brings me to that time. That's the that's the best thing about it. Yep. Beautiful. Well, uh it's been a pleasure talking with you guys. And I, I think uh very excited to see what you guys continue to do. I think you guys have already been doing an amazing job setting a precedent uh in the industry. So uh, thank, you. thank you guys for coming on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Absolutely, thank you. Thank, thank you guys for having us. Cheers. Yo, I thought that was dope, man. That was like, you know, like we said in the intro, one of one of my favorite episodes for sure. Um, I think one th- thing that we weren't necessarily planning on uncovering, but that we did, is just how quarantine has changed everyone's mindsets and how um, the people that were thinking about the box before quarantine will especially be the ones that can take advantage of it now because they are used to, to making themselves uncomfortable and leaning into discomfort and doing these things that make you a good entrepreneur in the first place. Now is the time where you have to do that to survive. You know, there's no more thinking inside the box. Um, so going over that, comparing marketing campaigns from, you know, however many years ago when Chris joined the, joined the music industry to today and the themes that kind of run through both of them was super dope. Um, and just general, like, good conversation, man. It's it's always good to get people on that are obviously very passionate about what they do and kind of let the microphone disappear. And, you know, we ended up just talking through everything in a very organic way. And I think that's, you know, that's what happened during this episode. What'd you think, Sam? Yeah, I thought it was incredible. A good mix of some, some just high-level principles that have helped them really grow their business all the way down to... Um, just very nitty gritty tactical advice and wisdom. So I, I think couldn't be more excited about how that one played out. Really also love the story with uh, how Leave Me Alone went double platinum and how they really just created these very valuable contextual moments uh, to reach out to to press, taking the Odell Beckham dancing clip and, and going to different sports media and media outlets and then using and that. And Lakel's record, dude. Like yeah. platinum first single. Yeah, talk about a unicorn moment, and we yeah, got to yeah. we got to really dive into it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so I thought it was great. Um, with that said, we'll be back next week, but definitely want to encourage you guys if you haven't already. Like we said in the beginning of the episode, super excited to have launched our Patreon account. Really excited to find interesting ways to really carry on the conversation with you guys. So, if you want to check it out, just go to musicbusinesspodcast.com dot com slash community, and you'll be able to uh, join in there. Yeah, man. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited to provide more value to you guys um, in a way that's that's tangible. You know, there's even a job board in the Discord channel because we're, we're trying to help people as much as we can join the music industry and really break into it. Um, we don't want we want the podcast just to be a place where our relationship starts, not finishes, you know, um, totally. and the Patreon will be a really a really great opportunity to do that. Exactly. So uh, musicbusinesspodcast.com slash community. And y'all know where to find us. We appreciate you greatly. Hope your quarantine is going well. Stay focused. Stay hungry. We out.